Heels in them. Mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, like, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today. We've had so many of these that you will know the format better than I do by now. But let me just run you through it. The candidates have drawn lots to speak, and they will each speak for six minutes. We'll keep them as close to time as we possibly can, and then we'll be open to question. And I'll say a, a word or two about those questions and what we were looking for and what we'd like to have once they have spoken. But the lots, as I say, have been drawn, and the person to start is Humza Youssef. Humza, you have six minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Uh, a lot of pressure in these hustings, I won't lie. You're in front of a big crowd, many people. This one is particularly pressured because my three-year-old daughter's in the room, and she's expecting me to mention Peppa Pig, but I said that's not really got anything to do with what we're doing here. Look, I'm delighted uh, to be here, to be obviously in uh, the, the city I grew up in, uh, raised in, educated in, and I have the great pleasure, of course, of representing Glasgow Pollock uh, in our Scottish Parliament. So really great to, great, great to be here, and I look forward to a really engaging uh, debate and discussion. For me, let me start, if I can, with two uh, promises to you, two pledges to you, if I may. Uh, first and foremost, you know, we are engaging and debating good ideas quite robustly. But for me, there'll not be any personal attacks. There'll not be any mudslinging because the only people who benefit from that are our opponents. And we've got to make sure that our opponents aren't given any ammunition uh, to do that. So look, a positive campaign about the positive ideas. And that's what we've got to center uh, our debate and our discussion on. The second one, of course, uh, is our track record. Um, again, we've got to have a robust discussion, robust debate. But I'll tell you this. I'm really proud of the track record of the SNP government. I think that track record of the SNP government has lifted children out of poverty. Actually, working alongside our colleagues in local government here in Glasgow, they've actually raised or lifted 6,000 more children out of poverty than any comparable region since 2017. That's down to local government, a local SNP government, working with a national SNP government. Our track record has seen the baby box, the expansion of childcare. It's seen more affordable homes than any other previous Scottish uh, government. So it's a track record I'm proud of and a track record I think we can build upon because if we talk that track record down, the only people who benefit are going to be our opponents. So let's make sure that we are building upon that excellent legacy uh, that Nicola Sturgeon, John Swinney and others have left us. Uh, for me, uh, of course, you will hear all our pitches in the course uh, of uh, this afternoon. Why do I want to be the next leader of the SNP, Scotland's next first minister? Well, I hope it's because you'll see throughout the course of this afternoon that I have the ability to reach out. I want to inspire people. I want to give them a positive vision of our progressive agenda and why I think we can win independence. Because there's plenty of failings of Westminster. We can all sit here and list them. That Tory cost of living crisis. The fact that a country as energy rich as Scotland has people who are fuel poor. The fact that from a, a stone's throw from here, we have the abomination of trident nuclear weapons. Instead of spending billions of pounds uh, helping the lives of ordinary Scots. But it's not enough to point out the failings of Westminster. If that was enough, the poll ratings for independence would be through the absolute roof. What we've got to do is give people a reason to vote for independence. What's the vision? What's the inspiration? Because people need hope. My God, people need hope now more than ever before. So I want to come forward with a vision that says I don't want to just reduce poverty. The powers of independence, I want to eradicate poverty. I want every single child in Scotland to have the same opportunities my child, my girls uh, do. I want to make sure that we unleash this country's potential for the well-being economy. Some of that work we're doing, but we could do so much more with the powers 
of independence. That well-being economy where the economy works for us, the people, not the other way around. And why else do I want to be the next leader of the SNP? I believe I've got the experience. I've had some of the toughest jobs in government, transport, justice, health. And there are challenges and continue to be challenges within our health service. But my goodness, those challenges would have been far more difficult if we had our NHS staff on strike. And I'm pleased that in Scotland, our, our NHS staff have never gone on strike, and certainly not uh, this winter. And that's not down to coincidence or good fortune. It's because I've been able to reach out to the trade unions, uh, meaningfully engage with them, bring them to the table, and I'm pleased that we found a compromise. And of course, our NHS staff remain the best paid in the entire UK. And why else? Because I want to restart and re-energize and kickstart the Yes campaign. The beauty of the Yes campaign was it was a people-led campaign. From Women for Indy, Business for Scotland, Scots Asians for Independence, all of those groups that came together, civic-led, grassroots movement that won the argument because we took it to the door, every single doorstep. It wasn't about political leaders sitting around a table devising strategies. No, the way we win our independence is that consistent, sustained majority. And their independence becomes politically inevitable. Yes, we've got to talk about process, but let's not fall into our opponent's trap and get obsessed by process. People out there aren't inspired. They don't get hope from Section 30s or de facto referendums. They get hope because we have a vision to lift them out of poverty, to make their lives better, to use our renewable potential to create a transformation for that well-being economy. We do that by getting to the doorsteps, by looking in the eyes, the whites of the eyes of people and persuading them about the case for independence. I've said often, I don't want to just be the first minister. I want to be Scotland's next first activist. I want to stand alongside you. So yes, I'll empower our membership. Because our membership, our party, you are the engine room. You will drive forward independence. And we have great talent right across the entire party. Whether it's in Westminster, Scottish Parliament, local government, our activists, our membership, and we must harness that talent. I would harness all of that talent. So look, I look forward to a really engaging debate, a really engaging discussion. I look forward uh, to your questions, and thank you so much for coming out here, and hopefully you'll put Hamza Yusuf as your number one choice. Well, good afternoon. It's wonderful to be able to join you. One of the great parts of doing these hustings, and the SNP have definitely made us work for this, doing hustings uh, all over Scotland, is looking out into rooms like this and seeing lots of familiar faces, friends, people who make the SNP feel like part of a family. There's even a few intruders from the Isle of Skye here today. And uh, it's wonderful to see you all. And it reminds me of the fact that at the end of the day, Whatever else we might disagree or disagree on, it's the fact that the SNP is a family. The SNP is a team united behind one goal. And that goal has never been more critical to achieve, that goal of independence. And looking back at the successive victories that the SNP has had, victories that have been delivered by your hard work and your ability to reach out to people, those victories have been built on one hugely important thing, and that is trust. We've been able to win the trust of the people of Scotland because we understood their priorities and we delivered. They could count on us through thick and thin, through Tory governments, through austerity, through the rise on poverty, through Bre Brexit, through COVID, through the cost of living crisis, they could count on us to listen, to understand their priorities and then deliver. And we are here at a crossroads as a party, as a country, as a movement, with the opportunity to reflect once again what it means to earn the trust of our people, to earn the trust of our fellow citizens. Because winning successive elections is critical but the goal is still the same, and that is independence. Back in the 70s, a number of members of my family started various different branches. Back when the Scottish Parliament was in the dim and distant future, 
when practically nobody turned up to branch meetings and when campaigning was a pretty lonely pursuit. But they believed, and it was that belief that carried them through those decades to the Scottish Parliament and on to the next generation, a generation that I'm part of, a generation that has grown up, which thinks of independence as normal. Many of you will know that I was on maternity leave until very recently, which is why I've got big bags under my eyes, because I've got a six-month-old baby that thinks playtime starts at 11 p.m. and ends at 5 a.m. But I look at her generation and I think this. If previous generations paved the way for my generation to believe that independence is normal, how do I pave the way for her and her peers to grow up in a country that doesn't just think of independence as normal, but actually lives in a country which is free, which is sovereign, which is wealthier, which is fairer, and which is greener. And that's the state, those are the stakes, and the stakes are high in this contest. And so taking a step back in terms of the debates that we are having right now about the next steps for our movement, the next steps are about who is best equipped and who has the best plan to deliver independence. And the recipe for success is the same as it's always been. It's listening to the people of Scotland, it's earning their trust, and it's delivering. And right now, people are concerned about how they're going to pay next month's energy bills in a country which is rich in energy. Kids are going to bed hungry in a country that has a plentiful supply of food. And that's where we need to look again at how we lead our people into the future and onto independence. And to do that, I think we need a leader who can take the fight to the opposition who can take the Tories on, who can take Labour on, and who can ensure that it's the SNP that has the trust of our people. We need somebody who will never take no from an answer from Westminster, who will always stand up to the UK government, and who will ensure that we don't just defend devolution, as important as that is, but we also use devolution to deliver for our people. And the last thing that we need is somebody who can campaign and make the economic case for independence at every and all democratic opportunities, who can be on the front foot. And my commitment as part of this process is to do all three, is to reach out to those who are yet to be persuaded. It may seem a bit ridiculous to be talking to SNP voters here and yet talk about those who don't yet vote for independence. But that's what we need to do as a movement, to reach out and to listen to secondly, to govern well, to ensure that we are tackling the issues, that we see it building on our track record of being able to pivot, to adapt, but always to serve our people. And lastly, to ensure that we never stop making the economic case for independence. Because independence is not an abstract term that we use in political arguments. Independence is the only way that we will eradicate the fact that one in four children today live in poverty. It's the only way that we will ensure we can properly grow our economy, grow our economy with a purpose to reinvest in our public services. It is the only way that Scotland can be finally free from the unjust practices that we're subjected to by uh, the Westminster government. And so the stakes are high. And if I go back, to that point around generations. When we think back to how previous generations paved the way for the next generation to believe in themselves and to believe in independence, the question for us now is, how do we pave the way for Scotland's children to grow up in a free and fair society? Because that's how high the stakes are in this contest. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Um, I think this is our, is our eighth hustings now, so um, we're certainly getting used to it. But I think this might be the biggest room that we've been in so far. Um, and it's lovely to be here in Glasgow with you today. Um, my, I represent Edinburgh, but before you let that put you off me, my parents are from Glasgow. So um, I spent a lot of time here when I was younger and a lot of my family still live in the area, so I love the city. Um, so I have been starting off by asking people to think about how they felt on the morning of the 19th of September.
But I know that there's a lot of people here that have either been attending multiple hustings or they've been watching the live streams online. So I won't go over that again today. But the reason I was telling the story about the Yes campaign was because I felt it really summed up, I think, some of the, the type of Scotland that we want to see, the type of Scotland that we want to get to. So it was this idea of that confidence, that hope, that optimism, confidence in being Scottish, creativity, everyone working together. And I really enjoyed that. I felt that Scotland um, had this uh, sense of self-belief at that time as well. And I think that that's the Scotland that we all want. I think that's the Scotland that we all want to live in and we want to work towards. And so um, I want us to get to that place as soon as possible. And I think that's uh, the difference between myself and the other candidates is that I have a plan to get us to independence as soon as possible. And I think at the moment, for me, and I don't know if you agree with this, I feel like for the last few years, we, in terms of the independence question, I feel like we've been uh, treading water. You know, it's as if we're, we're out at sea and we're swimming, we're treading water, we're in the same spot. And, you know, if we keep going on like that, you'll all know this. If you keep treading water, it uses up a lot of energy. And eventually, you're going to be swept away by the tide that comes along. So I think we need to change the direction that we're going in. I think we need to do things differently. I don't think we should be, certainly on the independence question, I don't think we should be repeating the same strategy that we've been using for the last few years, which so far hasn't been working for us in the way that we'd want to do it. So I want to relight the fires of the Yes campaign right across this country. I want to heal the rifts in our own party. I want us to work together as one because I think that that's the only way that we're going to get to where we want to go. I think we all need to work together. So my suggestion is that um, on day one, if I become the leader, I'm going to invite everyone to come along to what I'm calling an independence convention, just so that you understand what I'm talking about with that. And I know um, we have, there's many people that have been doing work on that type of thing. Um, I haven't waited to win this contest before doing that. I've actually been reaching out to organizations and um, people throughout the Yes movement, other political parties that are pro-independence to talk to them now about the idea of getting involved. And um, they're all very excited and inspired about working together towards this goal. But what I'm also suggesting that we do is that I also on day one, I'm going to be um, setting up what I'm calling an independence commission. So for anyone that hasn't heard that term already, the idea behind this is that would be a body that we would set up and it would be tasked specifically with doing all the preparation and all the planning and building the infrastructure, you know, anything and everything that we can plan and build before we become independent. So we would just start work on that right now. And the idea behind that is that if we can do that, and currency is the obvious example with this one, just as one option, that if we can do that and we can build the infrastructure as much as we can now, and then report to the public on the progress that we're making on that, then that gives people confidence that we're ready to become independent. So I think that's an important piece of the puzzle that we perhaps haven't thought about before. Um, as First Minister, I would see it as my role to um, be focusing on the priorities of the people of Scotland. So that would be things like the NHS, the cost of living crisis, um, and the economy and environment, and putting the absolute best people into the best, into the right roles, and then giving them the freedom to go off and run their departments as they see fit, and task them very specifically with delivering for the people of Scotland. And we also want to be as transparent and as accountable as we possibly can be, because trust in government is very, very important. And with building that trust and the trust in the government, that is how people will have confidence to move on with us towards self-determination. And I'm also suggesting that instead of sitting back passively and waiting, you know, for this, this day in the future when Westminster finally says, okay, yes, you know, go ahead and have a referendum, that we don't do that, and that actually having watched that strategy fail over the last few years, that actually what we do is we take control of this process ourselves. And I'm suggesting that we have what I'm calling a voter empowerment mechanism. And it just means that we run every election 
as an opportunity to let the people of Scotland decide if they want to become independent and then they will tell us when it's time, when they're ready. So I think um, if we pursue my strategy and you pick me as leader, we could be as close as one election away from becoming independent. Um, I looked at the figures the other day and the regional list for the last election was over 50% when all the independence parties were combined. And also we've had a poll out yesterday which put independence on 52%. So I think this is definitely um, a strategy that we should be looking at and I think it would be successful. And I'll just finish on this point. You know, leadership um, is not necessarily about the leader themselves. Leadership is about inspiring other people. Leadership is about building teams getting people to focus so that we can get to achieve what we want to achieve. And the best leaders can get us to achievements that other people didn't even believe were possible. Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you and thank you to each of the candidates. We now turn to questions. It's your turn to question each of the candidates. Um, I want questions, if I can get them, that will be able to be answered by all the candidates, not just by one candidate, but answerable by all of the candidates. Um, and I think it's the spirit of these uh, hustings that's been most impressive for me. Um, I, was, I don't know those of you who walked here from George Square, perhaps you'd have passed a very impressive statue of a man with a top hat. The top hat's particularly impressive. But the most impressive thing about that statue is the words on it. This, uh, this was James Oswald, the, one of the first post a re reform MP for Glasgow, and it says, erected by a few friends. Now, at that time, politics was about friends. Let's try and keep this meeting as a friendly, positive meeting from which we're all going to take something that's useful for us as we make our minds up. So, first question, I'm going to try and take them as much at random as I possibly can, but there will be people in this audience who will hate me at the end of this, and I'm just going to have to live with that. Right, we'll take this lady at the very start. Now, the microphones are coming, so let's... Uh, well, yeah, indeed, so, <laughs> so have I, but people still complain they can't hear, so on you go. We thought we were, were entitled to a referendum. Westminster said no. We passed the gender uh, recognition. No. Now, coming up is a coronation. Do they want our stone? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Will they ask us? No, they'll just take it. Do they want it? They'll have to ask. Her answer will be, of course, what? Thank you. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Ash. Yeah, so in terms of the stone, um, so I was asked for comment on this a couple of days ago, and this is one of these really interesting examples of where you haven't gone to the, you know, lots of times um, politicians, and particularly in this campaign, we're all doing this, you know, we're all sending out press releases, trying to get lots of coverage in the papers. And um, this wasn't one of those examples where I'd proactively put something out. We were asked for comment on the Stone of Destiny. And um, so my team were saying to me, well, what do you want to say about it? And I said, well, what's everyone else saying? And they said, well, some people are saying we should definitely not give it. And some people are saying it doesn't matter and just give it. So I thought, well, I think for some people, this is an issue that is of no consequence to them whatsoever. They, you know, they don't care about it. But then there's other people who think, you know, it's very significant. They feel that it has a special significance for their the history and, um, you know, part of, of Scotland's uh, national identity, perhaps. So I suggested a compromise um, position on this one. And I said that, you know, if they were going to use the stone, they need to bring it back as soon as possible. But as there's a, also the union of the crowns, and I think not everyone knows about that, and particularly in England, perhaps, they don't know about that, that perhaps there was a, um, a possibility that part of the coronation could take place in Scotland, you know, to bring Scotland into it more, rather than it all, you know, being carried out down there. <laughs> a compromise position. Anyway, the way, this, the way this got reported in the media was, uh, let's say it was very, very interesting how that ended up being reported in the media. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> Kate. Thanks very much. Well, I actually think that there's a very serious issue at the root here because whatever you think about coronations and stones, do you know what it reminds us? That Scotland is a proud nation with a proud past of being independent and sovereign. And yet, despite that, despite the people of Scotland being sovereign, the way that we are treated is disrespectful 
and the UK government is intent on constantly eroding devolution. Now, I don't think that the limit of our ambitions should be just to defend devolution. It's important. Don't get me wrong, it's important. But I think the limit of our ambition is nothing short of being once again that sovereign nation that won't be told what to do because we make our own laws, we make our own decisions, and we are just as entitled and just as talented to do that. And so for me, it comes back to some of my opening remarks, which is the stakes are high. It's about self-belief, but it's about not just persuading those who already believe in Scotland to vote for independence, it's about reaching out to those not yet persuaded to convince them and remind them of Scotland's sovereignty based not just on our past, but our past can't be forgotten about. And so this contest for me is about that one point. It's about bringing Scotland into a place where we don't get told what we can and can't do. We act like a sovereign nation once again. It, that day is coming. I think it's coming soon, but we've got a bit of work to do before we get there in terms of making the case for Scotland and demonstrating, not just telling, demonstrating how Scotland truly can be sovereign again. Thumbs up. Oh, sorry about the stone of destiny in particular. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, can, 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 we're not going to get through this, you know, if we keep having more questions on both sides. So an answer is an answer, and we leave it at that. Kate, do you want to just say a word or two more now you've been asked it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 do th I like the point that they should ask. They can't just assume. Oh, well, no, no, sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry. I have, I have the greatest respect for you, but you know, they're, they're here to listen to them. Okay. For, oh, um, for my friends on the panel, uh, this is the indefatigable Mrs. Pennycook, who is a stalwart <laughs> of our movement. The only correct response to any question that Ms. Mrs. Pennycook asks you is yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, ma'am. Anybody who knows Mrs. Pennycook, uh, Mrs. Pennycook is by far the only woman who terrifies even Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, so we, <laughs> we do what we tell with uh, Mrs. Pennycook. Um, uh, Look, uh, for me, yes, on, on, the stone, on the stone of destiny uh, question, and I'll get to the, the, the other uh, root of the issue, which I think Kate was right to pick up on here, uh, the stone of destiny. As First Minister, whoever is elected as First Minister, uh, there are duties that we're going to have to do because we're First Minister for everybody. Uh, I think it's right that we saw Nicola do that uh, when the Queen passed away and died. You put those personal sentiments and feelings. I'm a Republican. I don't make any ifs or buts or maybes about it. Um, but you have to put those feelings uh, to one side and do what is in the best interest of everybody in the country and do your duty as First Minister. So, look, if the stone uh, goes down, uh, I'll keep a blooming close eye on it to make sure it comes back up the road uh, as well. So that's really important. But I wanted to get to the root of what I thought was the, 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 the nub of the question, because um, there is an attack on our devolution. There is an attack on our democracy. There is an attack on our Scottish Parliament. And that Section 35 order, regardless of what you think about the GRR bill, and I respect my colleagues have got a, a difference of opinion. In this room, there'll be people who will support it, there'll be people who disagree with it. It actually isn't about the substance of the GRR bill. It is about the principle that a piece of legislation can be passed by a majority of our Scottish Parliament and the Secretary of State for Scotland, the Cabinet's man in Scotland, can think that he can strike a red pen and veto legislation that's not acceptable. So therefore, whoever the next leader of the SNP, and certainly I give my commitment as First Minister, if I am that, in that position, I will stand up unequivocally and challenge that Section 35 in court. We can do nothing less, because if we cave in, the first time they use their veto, they will use it after bill, after bill, after bill, and they will do that time and time again, and I won't stand for that. Thank you, and, and thank you for the liveliest start that we've had to one of these hustings so far. <laughs> Even I have never been invited to one of your fundraisers, and now I see why. But there we are. Please, we'll take a question here. Thank you. Given that the attainment gap in Scottish education isn't narrowing quickly enough, what would you do as First Minister? What would be the immediate priorities in education for you? Kate. 
My sister is a primary one teacher, and she's a great primary one teacher, I certainly think so. And she tells me that most weeks, before you even start doing the teaching, you've got to try and fill these wee babies, wee, wee kids' bellies. And some of them are four years old, five years old, and they're coming in and they're starving. And you can't expect kids to learn when they're starving. And the attainment gap, for me, is about more than education. Education, I'll come on to in a moment. But for me, the roots of the attainment gap are found in the absolute outrageous injustice that in a rich country like, country like ours, too many kids are deprived of food, of fuel and of love. And our teachers, I think, do a superb job at being that person that can offer support that's more than just teaching. But it starts with us being, which we are already, serious about eradicating the root causes of the attainment gap and that is poverty. Now, the Scottish Government has, and it's been in uh, all the budgets that I've certainly passed, the Scottish Government has used every last penny we have at our disposal to try and tackle the causes of poverty with the Scottish Child Payment, which of course is the only one in any of uh, the, the, the United Kingdom, the nations of the United Kingdom. And yet, we can only go so far because much of that funding is mitigating the cuts that the UK Government have already made. So when we increased it, actually, most of what we were doing was mitigating the cuts to universal credit. So here we are using our devolved funding to mitigate that. On to the education part, which is important. Education, we need to ensure that our teachers are empowered to teach these kids and young people and pupils as they find them. So I think we need to do more to empower teachers to make the decisions and we need to make sure that the funding that's going there is as flexible as possible so that they can adapt the funding to uh, the young people that they find. So for example, if they need to use that funding to support more uh, classroom assistance, additional support needs teachers, they can do that rather than it being tied up in rules and I think that for me is what's required when it comes to the attainment gap is a lot more flexibility a lot more trust in our teachers and a lot more willingness to say you know your children best so you meet their needs as you find them uh, so those would be probably the, the answer on the education because I know I've heard I need to answer the question uh, answering the, uh, the education part um, and obviously you know the curriculum is flexible, that's the whole point of Curriculum for Excellence, it should be flexible enough to be adapted to the young people. Thank you. Hamza? Thanks, Paula, for the, the question. It's um, a great question. And remember, of course, we, we don't talk about the attainment gap, we talk about the poverty-related attainment gap, because that is at the nub of it, that is at the heart of it that, uh, yes, we have made uh, absolute successes uh, in that regard, but there is a way to go. So that's why the priority of uh, the next First Minister has got to be to deal with the cost of living crisis. Because you deal with the cost of living crisis, then you deal with all of the other issues that it impact, poverty impacts on, including, of course, education. There's a few specifics, if I can give you, that I've already said uh, I would look to do. Um, first and foremost, we have a great track record on uh, expanding early, early learning uh, in childcare, the, the, the free offer of childcare. Uh, I'm keen to accelerate that, go quicker. Uh, so in my first budget as First Minister, I would um, make the funds available in order to expand that to one and two year olds. And not only that, we know, and, and I know this with my own uh, three year old, oh, who's left the room? Oh my, I must have been that bad that she left the room, right? Um, she, she, she left the room, but uh, for, we know that the upfront cost of childcare uh, can, can be quite prohibitive to accessing childcare. Uh, so I've uh, brought forward a scheme, or will bring forward a scheme, I should say, uh, that will give £500 loan uh, to parents that can pay that back at the end of their childcare, childcare journey to help with the initial upfront costs. Um, I think we've got to absolutely uh, empower our, our teachers. We've got good examples of that, people equity funding, where we give the money to the teachers to be ord in order so that they can spend it flexibly. We need to make sure that funding, not just the curriculum, but the funding that we give to our teachers, to our schools, is used as flexibly uh, as it possibly can. I think we should do more to accelerate breakfast clubs and after-school clubs, particularly in areas of deprivation, because, again, how many of our children, school children, are going to school hungry? 
uh, not acceptable in 2023, not acceptable in this day and age. But all of that helps with the poverty-related uh, attainment gap, which we're trying uh, to reduce. Um, the last thing uh, I would say uh, on this is there's far too many still of our children in Scotland who are not getting a timely diagnosis for autism, for learning disabilities, uh, for neurodivergence. And I, I, I and the government, uh, we've got to go further uh, on this because too many young children I meet, I know, I have in my own extended family, they waited too long. And they were already then at that point two or three or four years behind. If we got that diagnosis to them early, then the wraparound support that we could have provided them could have made all the difference to their educational journey. So it's about, at the nub of it, and, and I'll end on this point, it's about making sure no child is left behind. Yeah. Thank you. So this morning, before I, I came to the Sustings, I did a quick visit in Glasgow, so I went to see Who Cares Scotland. So uh, they work with, um, or represent actually, um, people in Scotland who've been care experienced. And I was lucky enough to get to meet some care experienced young people this morning um, who were telling me um, about, you know, various ways that, you know, that had impacted on their lives and, this, and the extra support that they, they rightly needed in order to make a success of their lives. And so I think there's, there's definitely more we could be doing on that in terms of delivering on that promise we made to care experienced children. But I also think that in schools at the moment, um, many teachers are expected to be acting as social workers, they're being expected to act as psychologists as well. And that is obviously taking up their time and it's not allowing them to you know, focus their, their time and attention on teaching, which is obviously you know, their main purpose for being in the classroom. So I think we need to increase um, the in-house support that we have for teachers. And if it's necessary in a school to have a social worker in-house or a psychologist in-house, I think that's something that we should be looking at so that we can free up teachers in order to do, to do their work. Um, I also think um, there's a lot of paperwork that teachers are expected to do, so I, I was, I'm wondering if there's a possibility of stripping away that bureaucracy, again, to free up teachers to spend their time actually teaching. I think we need to uh, grasp the thistle as well and do a review of the curriculum for excellence. Um, I'm not suggesting any sort of top-down reorganisation because I think teachers have absolutely had enough of um, that sort of thing, but I, I do think we maybe need to have a look at that and, and, and talking with teachers to see where we need to go forward on that. I am also have looked at some of the information on, so this is more to do with the early years, that some other um, European countries have a different system for us. And rather than children starting school at, you know, as they can in Scotland at four, uh, they are in a sort of a more of a kindergarten system. So they're still um, in a, you know, an educational setting, but it's uh, <coughs> less formal, it's more play-based and so on. And they do that till they're seven, and then they move into a more formal system. And there's some good international evidence um, about how well that works and what sort of a start that gives for children. So that's something that I would also like to like for Scotland to look at and, and see if there's something that we can learn there. So yes, yeah, so my main message would be let teachers teach and give them the support that they need to be able to do that effectively. Thank you. Now, we're going to take that gentleman there. And there's a microphone coming to you. So just wait for it. Uh, broadcasting is currently reserved to Westminster. Do any of the candidates have any ideas about how we can place broadcasting under the remit of the Scottish Parliament so that, for example, we could replace the BBC with a Scottish Broadcasting Corporation, but do this before we are independent? Thank you. And um, we start with Hamza. Well, just look at the mess that they've made of Match of the Day, BBC. And by the way, uh, Gary, <laughs> Gary Lineker, as I said before, didn't just hit the back of the net with his refugee comments. He scored a blooming hat-trick, right? He was absolutely right. And of course, it seems to be for the BBC, it seems to be for the BBC that you can have free speech uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're talking up with the Conservatives, but you can't have free speech when you're doing them down and talking about their abhorrent, their immoral practices. And I'm a supporter of public broadcasting, and I would be, of course, in an independent Scotland uh, too. But my goodness, caving into pressure from a right-wing government, uh, the BBC need to take a long, hard look uh, at themselves. Um, for me, a couple of things. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we make the case passionately, all of us in this 
uh, auditorium, make the case passionately for independence, shouldn't stop us from making sure we do everything in our gift to try to get as many of those powers uh, from London to Scotland and then devolving them even further, I have to say as well. Uh, so yes, we should absolutely do that. But let me say this, we shouldn't wait around. Uh, if I was the first minister and leader of the SNP, one of the first things I would do is make sure our headquarters has an instant rebuttal unit. Instant re-rebutting the nonsense, the nonsense that comes from our opponents and the nonsense that comes from some sections of the media. Because our, our team and headquarters do a great job, and be no, and no doubt of that. But what we've got to do is not just wait for the next day to put out a press release. It's too late. It's got to be absolutely instant. And it's got to be all over social media. It's got to be all over media too, because we know that the traditional media is still read by some, but we've got to be all over social media, all over where people are, where they get their news uh, today. So look, I won't take up uh, too much time other than say I absolutely agree with you. If this last couple of days tells us anything, it reminds us we need our own uh, public uh, broadcaster. And I would resist any privatisation of the likes of Channel 4 as well, I should say. But let's make sure we're not waiting around for that. Let's get the instant rebuttals. And certainly as leader of the SNP, I'd make sure I beefed up and had that instant rebuttal unit in our headquarters. Sure. Ash. Yes, we've, we've spoken about this at some of the other hustings that we've attended. Um, and I was observing at those ones that certainly in 2014, you know, it was a very challenging media environment for us um, in that we didn't have any newspapers supporting us until very late on. I think the Sunday Herald did come out to support us. So it's obviously it's a very difficult environment to work in. And I, I'm always making that um, the comparison with Catalonia where, you know, they have four TV channels, you know, dedicated to pro-independence content. And you just sometimes you wonder, you know, what would the level of support be for Scottish independence if we had, you know, that different level of media? And I think we can all um, have an idea of what that might be like. Um, I, we were down at Dumfries um, a few days ago, and m some people aren't aware that, Dumf that that area in the south of Scotland, the TV licensing system works differently. They don't even receive the content from STV. They're receiving um, ITV and some English um, programming. So, uh, so that's interesting. And then it seemed as if, by calling attention to that, uh, when we had the STTV debate the other night, they actually managed to then screen that for the South of Scotland as well so that they could take part, which I think was a win. So I think that was good that they got to see that. But it shouldn't be like that in the first place. So I think there's, there is some things we can do. I, uh, when I first got elected, um, you're kind of chucked in the deep end when you first become an MSP or an MP. And I think there's definitely um, ways that we could be trained up more, maybe more media training, about how to effectively get that message out there when we do get the chance to be on TV, that we get that out. So that's something I think we could be looking at. And, um, but I think in terms of getting powers over broadcasting, I don't think they're going to they're gonna give us the powers, you know, even if we ask them extremely nicely and repeatedly. So I think my plan for that would just be to say that we just go full speed ahead for independence and know that when we're an independent country, obviously the media landscape, we can then set up exactly how we would like to see it. And uh, we can all receive content, you know, whether you're the different things that you're interested in or different political viewpoints, so that would be my plan. Thank you. Kate. So the short answer is that yes, I do think that broadcasting should be accountable to the Scottish Parliament. And it's always worth saying, this is not about accountability to the SNP. It's not even accountability to necessarily those who vote yes. It's just accountability to Scottish representatives. You know, that's what this is about at its uh, core, is that the people of Scotland who send their representatives to the Scottish Parliament should uh, be uh, the, 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 the focus when it comes to that accountability. And I can think of so many times, I can think of uh, one of the last elections being part of a, a debate being run by the BBC, and it was a UK-wide debate. And it was fascinating, because the audience were asking, do you know what, do you not think it's about time that we cut university fees? And I'm like, we've already done that. Do you not think it's about time that we integrated health and social care? Already done that. Do you not think it's about time that we expanded childcare? already done that as well. So the point is that we have to be able to identify the great strides that we've made in Scotland. And actually a lot of that is not getting picked up because people are not hearing about it. Uh, and that's certainly the approach that we need to take absolutely to make sure that we communicate our points. We use every means possible. Social media has its place, but we can't forget uh, the broadcasters or the newspapers either, which is why I think we've all got a responsibility to just keep hammering those messages home about the track record we do have and how we've delivered for people in Scotland, because it's through delivery that we earn people's trust. And when we have their trust, we can lead them to independence. 
Right. I'm going to I'm going to go up into the mountain here. Um, gentlemen, the front row there. There, thank you. Thank you. Um, many LGBT members of our party are wondering what the future of our party is um, and whether it also be a safe and welcoming place for us in the future. Um, not least given some of the comments that have been made in the course of this leadership race. So what will you do to rebuild trust with the LGBT community? Ash, you're first. Yeah, so uh, this came up um, last night as well. So uh, apologies if uh, people have been listening to the answer because I'm just going to say the same thing that I said then. So I'm a committed lifelong progressive. Uh, I wasn't in the parliament when um, the vote on equal marriage took place, but I, I'm on record as saying over the last few weeks that had I been there, I would have voted for it. Um, I was invited to a wedding of um, some friends of mine, friends and activists actually in the party, um, a couple of years ago, Jean and Elaine. And I think they'd been together for something like, I think it was over 20 years, it could have even been 30 years that they'd been together, and they weren't able to formalise their relationship by getting married until a few years ago. And I have to say, I've been at a lot of weddings over my time, and I have to say it was probably um, one of the most moving weddings that I've ever been at, just watching how happy they were to get to that point where they could, you know, formalise their relationship in, in that way. So it was really, it was really moving to see that. And just to reiterate this, you know, that I want everyone in Scotland to be able to live their most authentic lives. I want people to feel that they can be themselves. I want them to live in peace and safety and dignity. And to say to everyone that if I become First Minister, I will see it as my privilege and my duty to um, protect and advance everyone's human rights. Thank you. Humza. Do you know, um, let me just be unequivocal about it, that if you are part of the LGBTQ uh, community, that you don't need, your existence does not need to be justified by three straight people sitting in this panel. <laughs> your, and I, I mean, I'm genuinely getting a bit emotional actually because I was reading a, a Twitter thread yesterday, day before yesterday, of someone who was just, couldn't believe that we're in 2023 and people are questioning your existence. I mean, I cannot imagine as a Muslim watching three people who are not Muslim sitting in a panel questioning whether my lifestyle was acceptable or morally superior or inferior to theirs. So be in no doubt that as leader of the SNP and as First Minister of Scotland, I wouldn't just tolerate you, I would celebrate you. We are here to celebrate our diversity. That's what makes our country so great. I'm a product of that celebration. You know, when my grandfather came here in the 1960s, I've been celebrated. Don't get me wrong, God, the racists and the idiots, we all get those in any country. But I've been, I've been celebrated. And you must feel that the next leader of the SNP, that you can look at them in the eyes and you believe that that person won't just tolerate you, won't just, won't just defend your rights or stand up for your rights, but where possible, uh, advance uh, those rights. I've lived my whole life as a minority in this country. And let me make it really clear to you. If they come after your rights, they come after my rights. Right? If they come after you, they're coming after me. Right? Because I, my rights do not live in some kind of vacuum. My rights are interdependent on your rights. So if, as your first minister, I will not just defend, I will be the first one on the front line ensuring that nobody comes after your rights, either under devolution or in an independent Scotland. Well, the SNP is rightly reflective of the rich diversity of the Scottish people. And Scotland has made great strides, uh, particularly in the last few years, in being a more liberal and tolerant place where minorities can feel safer and more secure. And it's that rich diversity that makes Scotland the place that it is. Uh, whether it's uh, ethnic minorities, LGBT uh, groups, or uh, those of our, our religious faith. And I think when it comes to the approach that the next First Minister needs to take, and it's the approach that I would take, 
is to first of all defend every legal protection that is in place for every Scot, whether they are gay, straight, male, female or trans, and also look to how we enhance those rights so that we can all flourish in Scotland. And the last point I would make is that the SNP is a democratic institution. And by that I mean it's members that set policy, it's leaders or government that enact that. So policy needs to be built by those who have the experiences, the interests, the background, the lived experience. And within the SNP, within the wider Yes movement, we have groups, organisations that are on the front line when it comes to defending those rights. And any future leader needs to not just claim to defend the rights that we already have, but also to engage, to listen, and then go back to government and ensure that they enact the policies that have been set by SNP members. Because we're accountable to the public, yes. We're accountable to constituents, yes. But we are ultimately accountable to you in the, in the last and the first place. I'm trying to be fair and move around the hall. I'll take, um, I'll take the lady there uh, who's got her hand up. Yep. Microphone's just on its way to you. You're quite a long way away, so just wait a second. Uh, right up there at the, at the back, third row down, and a long way in. Um, hello, my question is specifically around asylum. Um, we're in the absolutely brilliant city of Glasgow, home um, of the biggest, I think, per head um, population of uh, people who are seeking asylum in the whole of the UK. Um, so I, in the spirit of positivity that Mike has talked about, I would like you to talk about some of the uh, Scottish Government specific policies around asylum, which ones you, well, I hope you're proud of them all, but which ones that you think have been particularly effective to support uh, people who are seeking asylum? Thank you. Um, and the first person on that one is Kate. Thanks very much. Well, before I start talking about policies, what has always moved me is that no matter what government is in place in Westminster, the people of Scotland stand with asylum seekers and we will never, ever give in to the fear and the nonsense when it comes to defending our fellow humans, uh, our fellow uh, uh, citizens uh, in terms of asylum seekers. And I think that image of Scotland as a welcoming, open place to refugees, to asylum seekers, to those who have chosen to make Scotland their home is critical. You know, the question was asked last night by a new Scot, what more we could do to make Scotland a welcoming place? And if there was ever an argument for us to have control over immigration, over our borders, it is the welcome that we need to give uh, asylum seekers. And I think when it comes down to it, we obviously are extremely constrained right now by what we can do. And yet, despite that, we are doing everything possible to ensure that we do offer that warm welcome to asylum seekers. I think it's an absolute disgrace that we can't go further with the powers that we have. We can't allow asylum seekers to work, for example, in this country. We have them you know, housed in uh, horrendous circumstances and can't give them a warm, uh, affordable homes. A country which has a track record, a history, 300 years Scotland has, of too high emigration, people leaving. You know, so many Scots over the last few decades have left these shores. We welcome people to come and make Scotland their home, particularly when they are fleeing persecution. And I actually can't look at some of the images, especially after having a baby, at these images of some of these women with babies fleeing war, fleeing persecution, looking for peace and stability and finding a country which is as rich as ours, not able to deliver that warm welcome because of intentional political policies by this Tory government that is intentionally making it unwelcoming. So if there was ever an argument for the fact that people in Scotland want a different future, it's the fact that we want to be able to welcome fellow citizens, fellow humans, fellow members 
of uh, the human race uh, here as they seek warmth, as they seek peace, and as they just seek somewhere to raise their kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, and obviously it's a, you know, it's an international obligation to be able to uh, fulfill that and to provide sanctuary to people who have been persecuted elsewhere. And it's a very important international obligation to live up to. And I know that Scotland has a, an excellent record in um, fulfilling that obligation, even though we're obviously constrained in what we can do in terms of being part of the UK. Uh, and I know that the no re recourse to public funds can be an issue. And I know that um, the inability to work can also be an issue. So there's undoubtedly you know, more that Scotland would want to do if Scotland was in charge of these policies ourselves. Um, but I'll just tell you a story. So when I was, um, so it was last year and I was still in government and um, I was the Minister for Community Safety and as, as part of that work, I had been doing some work on um, modern slavery. So I went to visit a safe house. Um, obviously we were, you know, taken in, they were know where it was. Um, the women there had been, um, uh, sex trafficked in from um, East <coughs> Africa. Um, there were four of them. They were quite nervous, actually, about speaking to somebody um, who was seen as you know, an authority figure, somebody who was in, in government. And we didn't specifically talk about their stories because I, I also feel this, that there's, um, you know, we shouldn't get to the point where we're constantly asking people to sort of relive their trauma. That can be very damaging. So we didn't talk about that. And actually, they were in the process of um, recovery. You know, they're receiving support from um, our third sector partners in, in Scotland to help to get their lives back on track, to get them access to the services that they needed um, in order to, um, you know, uh, live in this country and go on to be um, citizens. Um, they were training, so one of them was training to be a nurse, and she was really far on in that process. She'd been doing that for some time. You know, and I just think that opportunity to sit with them and talk to them a little bit about, you know, obviously the, what had happened to them, but how they were putting their lives back together. Um, it was a real, it was a beacon of hope, actually. They were very inspiring that having been through something like that, that they were, we were able to give them that support to help them to get to the place that they were in now where they were, you know, living their lives and putting their, their lives back together. It was very inspiring. Thank you. And, um, what was that? There's lots of reasons why I love this city, but one of the reasons why I love it so much is that time and time and time again, when we see the worst of the UK government, in George Square, we see the very best of Scotland. Because we have stood in George Square time and time again, advocating, pleading for the UK government to do right by our refugees and asylum seekers. In fact, I remember, I can see here, stalwart of the SNP, Sandra White, how many times we've stood in George Square protesting against the abhorrent UK government's refugee policy. And we should say it loud and we should say it clear that refugees are welcome here. And I'm really proud of the fact that one of the first things I did when I was appointed in government, I was Minister for External Affairs, was put in charge uh, of the Syrian refugee uh, scheme. And so proud that not just the Syrian refugee scheme, but if you look at what we've done in relation to Ukrainian refugees, we welcome more refugees here in Scotland per head than any other part of the UK. And that's a badge of honour. That's something we should be really uh, exceptionally proud of. To answer your direct question, there's a lot of policies. Um, you see, you're maybe familiar with the New Scotland strategy. Uh, what I'm particularly proud of, of is the fact that we continue to fund local community organizations, one of my constituency, the Govern, Govern Community Project, we continue to fund those organizations that are working with refugees to help them with food, to help them with housing, to help them with school and education. Um, so there's lots of, lots of um, uh, policies that I'm very, uh, very proud of. But I want to go, and I want to finish on the point that how we treat those that are the poorest, and I agree that asylum seekers absolutely should have the right to work. How we treat the poorest and the most vulnerable in our society, and I'm not sure there are anybody, there are a group that is more vulnerable or poorer, particularly than asylum seekers. How we treat them is a mark of how we will treat the poorest and vulnerable when we're an independent nation. And I think if we can demonstrate our values now, we can do everything in our gift, even though the power remains with the UK government, do everything in our gift to give asylum seekers and refugees the warmest welcome possible. Well, that's a demonstration of how we act in the early days 
of a new nation. And my goodness, God help us if we are stuck in this unequal union for a moment longer. If we ever need help like refugees do, I hope that the world treats us far better than the UK government treats refugees. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm working my way around the back at the moment. So uh, is there anybody in this block here that wants to ask a question? And if not, I'm going to move on from there. Uh, yes, there's a gentleman there, uh, two rows down. Just get his hand up. Somebody with a microphone there. I promise you I'm going to finish up in the front again. I can see people beginning to look very annoyed with me. Um, gentleman there. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm a local councillor for one of the, the most deprived communities in Glasgow. Um, I believe that if we, if we can change the lives in the communities for the better, for local communities, that will encourage people uh, to vote yes uh, in an independence rec uh, referendum. So the question is, how do you rate the importance of local government and will you commit to giving a settlement that allows all councillors in Glasgow to give uh, a proper service to our constituents? Thank you. Uh, we, we start with Hamza. It's a great uh, question. And uh, look, I know uh, the ward that you represent, and look, I've represented Glasgow Pollock, had the pleasure of doing so uh, since uh, 2016. And I know the challenges that we face with poverty, whether it's in my constituency in Govan and Lint House, I see in Priest Hill and Nitz Hill. And over a decade of austerity has just entrenched some of that poverty that we're obviously combating as best we possibly can within the constraints of devolution. Uh, to answer your question directly, yes, we need that new deal with government. If I'm First Minister, I want a house-style uh, agreement with local government the same way that we've done with the Greens. I want to make sure that we are empowering local government because at the moment, let's be frank, let's speak honestly with each other, uh, our local councillors don't feel like they're part of the team enough. Uh, they feel sometimes we're doing things to them as opposed to being part of the team and devising that strategy. So I want to harness the talent of our hundreds, our army of local government councillors right across the country, harness that talent to co-design policy. What does empowerment mean? Empowerment means... Not knocking over your microphone. Empowerment <laughs> means, empowerment means uh, ensuring that we review the funding. Absolutely. You've got to have a fair funding settlement that you're confident you can make the changes that you need in your local communities, but also the funding mechanisms. Uh, Glasgow have come forward before with uh, excellent ideas around financial flexibilities, and the government uh, hasn't moved on them. Uh, we should move on them. We should ensure there's flexibility within the funding, loosening the ring fencing, so making sure that we absolutely allow you and empower you to do what you need to do in your local communities is something uh, that I uh, absolutely want to see. But I want to go further. I don't just want to empower you in local government. I want to get right into community councils. I want to devolve even further. They do phenomenal work. I've been to community councils. You'll go leg regularly to your community councils. You know, people that give up their weekday evenings uh, in order to you know, really help uh, and aid their community. So this is about empowering local government. It's going further than local government and making sure we get right into the heart of our community. And this may seem like a bit of a, a techie kind of internal point, but I think it's worth uh, me making that um, as First Minister, I would want to not just have our cabinet as we do in government, I want to have regular political cabinet. And at that political cabinet, I don't just want MSPs and MPs there, I'd want to have local government there because you've got your ears right to the ground. You know what's going on in your local wards day in and day out. And I think if we harness the talent of this party, which has got to include local government, my goodness, we could really, really transform the lives of people on the ground. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. Well, one of my main arguments for independence is that you should give power to the people because the people who are affected are the people that should be making the decisions. And I think that principle applies uh, to local government. And my approach to, to local government is I think we need a fundamental review of how to decentralise power further and how to empower those who truly are on our front line. It's the only way we're going to eradicate poverty. You know, you know your communities, you know the charities, the third sector that are working on the front line. You know the teams within local government that are working on the front line. Uh, and they need to work together. You know, what's going on in our schools? What's going on uh, when it comes to um, those third sector organisations? Who's providing uh, food? Who's providing uh, the sports facilities and so on? So 
ultimately, I think, when it comes to local government, local government are best placed, far better placed, actually, than the Scottish government to know what works locally. So how would I do it? Here's three ways. First of all, reduce ring fencing. It's an argument that I've made. Uh, I've obviously been finance secretary, understanding how constrained budgets are. Budgets are really constrained. At a time of constrained budget, you need to make every penny go as far as possible. And you know how to spend the funding better than anyone else in Glasgow. So reduce as much ring fencing as possible. Secondly, ensure that you are actually developing the policies, whether that's on housing, whether that's on social care, whether that's in uh, education, developing the policies that will work. And the third thing is about ensuring that we don't just empower local government, but we're actually empowering the teams that are out there doing the work. Because it's all very well talking about empowering local government, but if that power just stays at the highest level of local government, doesn't actually get down to the teams, then we're not solving the problem as far as I can see. So it's about devolving the power and empowering our front line. So uh, you know, a carer on the front line that can identify a problem can quickly use their own initiative, their own powers, their own abilities to solve it. So those would be three quick ways I think we need to fundamentally change local government. And I think if we don't, then we're not going to eradicate poverty. So that's how critical it is that we do. Yeah. yeah, I'm committed to providing more funding to our local councils and also reviewing the funding system as well to look and see if we can make it fairer and more sustainable. So I think that could either mean that we look again at council tax, maybe there's a way that that could be reformed, or we look at alternatives to council tax. I think that's something that we should be looking into. Um, and I also think that we should look again and perhaps review ring fencing. So I know that can be an issue. Um, I think it makes um, councils sometimes feel that they don't have the ability to make the decisions that suit their local area as much as they would like to because they're constrained by that. So I think that's something that we could be looking at as well. I also think there is an element of that sometimes it feels like Scottish government are doing things to councils rather than working with councils. So I think we should look again at that relationship we have between the two spheres of government. And I think we can do things like quarterly meetings with the councils. Um, I've made a suggestion that the cou our council leaders should be coming to political cabinet. And that's a way that we can then bring everyone together. We can work together. We can listen to different ideas and make sure that we're all on the same page. I also think there might be an opportunity for additional sources of funding. So there's perhaps creative ways we could be looking at raising more money, which could then be kept in local communities and local communities themselves would make the decisions on what was important and what they wanted to spend that money in. So yes, strong <coughs> local services are very important because with those strong services, you get stronger communities. Thank you. Now we're getting towards the end at the moment, so we just need to be careful that we're getting as many questions in as possible. So I'm going to take that lady there. It's you. I'm only saying that lady because I don't want to show that I know people. Otherwise, they'll think it's favouritism. So <laughs> if I've insulted you, sorry. On you go. Hi, uh, Suzanne McLaughlin, Glasgow Kelvin Branch. Um, now, uh, it's a, a question that's been addressed in Hussies, but it's a slightly different angle towards it. And I just want to pin down some correct answers here. So today, there are women in Scotland travelling down to England, a country that I feel is regressive in its values. It is a right-wing Tory, xenophobic, horrible country, and there are women who are having to travel down to England to access abortion health care because we can't provide it in Scotland. Now, the women that are doing having to travel to access this, it's late abortions, which are always under the most tragic of circumstances. And I want to know what the candidates would do to make sure that women do not have to travel down to England to access necessary gynaecological health care. Thank you. Thank you. Ash. Yeah, I would agree that that does not seem like that's a situation that we would want to be carrying on with. Um, so just so everyone knows, I am I am pro-choice myself. I think that this particular provision of, of health care um, for abortions is essential health care that must be available to women. So I completely support that. And, you know, if there was ever, you know, we were voting on that, you know, I would vote for that. We do have a vote coming up in Parliament shortly. There's a bill... Um, this is not specific on the healthcare aspect, but it's related to it. 
um, which many people will no doubt be aware of. There's a, a member's bill that's been put forward by Gillian Mackay of the Greens. Um, it's at the consultation stage at the moment. And this is the issue of um, buffer zones outside uh, abortion clinics, because we'll have seen, and I think we particularly have seen this in Glasgow, that sometimes that, um, what maybe initially started out perhaps as a pe peaceful protest is and then rapidly kind of escalating into the kind of situation where both the staff and women accessing healthcare are feeling like they're running the gauntlet past noisy, potentially aggressive protesters. Now, I'm sure you can imagine that women accessing this type of healthcare are clearly going to be feeling under stress, they're going to be under emotional pressure. So to have to face that in order to go in and access necessary healthcare is obviously not acceptable. So just to say as well that I'll be supporting that uh, member's bill when it comes in front of Parliament. Okay. Kate. Thanks very much. I, as a young woman, understand the challenges when it comes to uh, ensuring that there is sufficient support when we need healthcare services. And I agree with you that I don't think any woman goes for a termination lightly, and it must be one of the most traumatic experiences that I can imagine. In terms of the, the care and support that we have in Scotland, I think we actually need to do far more when it comes to wraparound support from beginning to end for women in these situations. Any friend I've had in a situation who's had to go through that talks about the, the trauma and the challenge of it all. And so to have to travel on top of that is only exas exasperating the, 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 the trauma. So Ash has talked about buffer zones and the harassment and fear, which we need to stop. And I think we do need to look at how we ensure that the wraparound support for women at every stage is there so that the, the trauma and the anxiety which will be present is not exasperated. Um, the last thing I would say on, on that is that when it comes to the, the wider healthcare provision in Scotland, you know, I think this is part of a, a wider question around having the, the clinical expertise in Scotland and ensuring that the NHS has the clinical support that is required in Scotland when it comes to all forms of healthcare eh, and not just um, the, the healthcare that you've identified. Thank you. Come, sir. Um, so, Suzanne, uh, I'm not sure if you felt you got absolute clarity uh, in that answer, but look, to be absolutely clear, because I think it's important we should have late-term abortion services provided here in Scotland. Uh, no ifs, no buts. And actually, as Health Secretary, I'm working with Marie Todd, uh, Minister for Women's Health, uh, to take that forward. Because we know they're low in volume, um, so we've got to make sure that there's a centre of expertise, perhaps in Scotland. We can pilot that in a couple of health boards, to try to reduce the travel uh, as much as we possibly can, but have those centres of expertise uh, here in Scotland. Because they are small uh, in volume, but, but they require a certain clinical expertise. So, without any doubt, yes, we should. Uh, so, uh, well, we are making movement on that. We should accelerate that as best we possibly can. There's two other things I would mention uh, in relation to, to health go out, healthcare and abortion uh, services and women's health in particular. Um, I, I also, like Ash, uh, support the, the, the safe access zones, uh, as they're called. We know that they're in some places uh, in England. Uh, I'm also, uh, again, not going to leave you with a scintilla of doubt uh, that in those safe access zones there should be no protest, peaceful uh, or otherwise, because what that does, of course... <laughs> Because people may think that they're being peaceful in their protest, but I don't know if any of you saw the comments from Dr. I think it's Greg Irwin, who was a consultant at the Sandyford, uh, who was saying that this is some of the most traumatic, pe this is a traumatic day, the most traumatic day for some of our mothers, uh, our daughters, our nieces, and to have to go past people, whether they're in silent judgment or otherwise, that's not acceptable. That is a pr that is a barrier to accessing healthcare. There should be no barriers for anybody when it comes to accessing healthcare. The very last thing uh, I would say, and I've said this to groups like Back Off Scotland, I can't for the life of me understand why access to abortion is still a criminal a matter of the criminal law. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and so as First Minister, I'd want to explore that issue and how we decriminalise it and make it an issue of healthcare. Thank you. I, um, I want to take one from over here and then we'll take the last couple from down on the floor. 
There's a, a gentleman at the back with his hand up there and a white shirt on. Andrew Eric from Paisley. I believe that our SNP is progressive, a progressive party. And I'm proud to say that I'm a member of that family, as we said earlier. What values do you hold that show that you are socially progressive rather than regressive and, or God forbid, conservative? Uh, <coughs> and, uh, and, and that you are the best person to lead our party for all of the people of Scotland at this time and for our future? And uh, do you value our strong coalition with our progressive partners in the Scottish Green Party? Thank you. Uh, I think that's what's called a portmanteau question. There's lots of questions in it. So let's take it. In any case, uh, it starts with Kate. So the definition of progressivity is that as a government, as a party, as individuals, as people, we care about those who have no voice. And we care about the minority groups. We care about ensuring we use all of our resources, whether that's financial, whether it's power in the form of government policies, to ensure that Scotland is a fairer country. That is the definition at its heart. And in terms of my approach to this, my approach after being a, a local MSP who, who represents people, has been how do we use our money better? How do we use our budgets to ensure that we are pursuing that fairer approach? How do we ensure that we have more funding going to taking children out of poverty? How do we ensure there's funding in place to give refugees, asylum seekers, and uh, for example, uh, Ukrainian refugees most uh, recently, how do we ensure that we deliver for them? That's the approach I've taken to, to budgets, to put fairness at its heart. Now, perhaps one of the most obvious ways you've seen that is when it comes to taxation. Because despite the fact that we have very limited powers over taxation, we've got a few powers over income tax, we've used those powers to be more progressive. When it comes to the only business tax that we have, non-domestic rates, we've used that to be more progressive in terms of uh, supporting those who, who have a, a, perhaps a smaller voice. So those are the values, those are the reasons that I joined the SNP because I believe that Scotland should be a fairer country, a more equal country. But we can't escape the fact that despite our track record and our ability to deliver, there are deep-seated inequalities in Scotland right now. The deep social economic inequalities in Scotland where the age difference in terms of life expectancy between the most deprived area in Scotland and the least deprived area in Scotland is 26 years. There are people dying 26 years younger than they would do if they were in a wealthier part of Scotland. That is an absolute outrage. So have we made progress? Yes. Do we need to do more? Absolutely. Are the devolved powers enough to do that? No. That is why we need independence. There's never been a more significant and urgent reason to deliver independence than to actually make our progressive values, not just values in terms of policy, but actually deliver better outcomes for the people that rely on us to make those better outcomes. Thanks, sir. Andrew, it's just such a good question and in one sense gets to the heart of this very election contest because what happens when Nicola stands down is there's an opportunity to go in one direction or the other. And I've made it clear that I want to, of course, I'll be my own person and demonstrate my own leadership and my own leadership style, but I want to build on that progressive agenda because it is that progressive agenda which has seen us win election after election after election. It's that progressive agenda which has grown our support for independence to the heights that we have it. And if we move away from that progressive agenda, if we roll back from that progressive agenda, my real concern, forget about growing support for independence, we'll lose support for independence. We'll end up losing not just young people, though we'll lose a lot of young people, we'll lose people right across the spectrum who joined our party because they believe in those in that progressive uh, agenda. So I want to build uh, upon that. And again, I can't think of any better city that demonstrates those progressive values than the city of uh, Jimmy Reid, right? The city uh, that, 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 that uh, 
has stood time and time again advocating that progressive agenda. And this, of course, used to be a Labour heartland. Ain't a Labour heartland anymore. Why? Because we showed people how progressive we are. And for me, um, I want to show that right throughout every single policy area if I'm First Minister. I am, um, again, unequivocal my support for progressive taxation. I think those who earn the most should pay the most in order to invest in our public services. I believe... that I believe in the well-being economy. I believe that we've got to be more bold and more radical on land reform. As First Minister, I bring forward an act, on, a bill on land reform because our land in Scotland is in the hands of too few people. It should be in the hands of the many, not of the few. When it comes to, when it comes to renewables, let's not just lease off those renewables in Scotland, let's take an equity stake. So when they make profit, it doesn't just go in the pockets of shareholders, it comes back to the people so we can reinvest in our communities too. So being progressive has got to be in every single area, every single agenda uh, of the next First Minister of Scotland. To answer your question about the Green Party, which you asked, uh, again, I have made it absolutely clear, I think, throughout this contest, that that deal with the Greens, for me, is worth its weight in gold. It's worth its weight in gold because we have a pro-independence majority in that parliament that means we can govern well. Can you imagine if the next First Minister of Scotland, the first act would be to rip up the agreement, by the way, which was endorsed by 95% of the SNP membership, that ripping up that agreement, rejecting the Greens, and you then have to go and pass legislation and pass your first budget with the support of Douglas Ross or Anna Sauer, good luck with that. I mean, good luck with that. And not only will it affect us in the parliament, it'll have ripple effects right to local government. We have a good relationship with a Green Party locally. We've got tensions, got disagreements, but a good relationship. We can't afford to let them turn uh, sour. So for me, uh, if you want to be a unifier, as I hope I am and will be as the next leader of the party, then the first thing we have to do is make sure we maintain that relationship with the second largest pro-independence party in the country. Ash. Yeah, so on the, the progressive, I, f um, I am a committed lifelong progressive, so I've already been very clear and, and put that on the record over the last few weeks. Um, and if we talk about the, the coalition with the Greens, <coughs> that's obviously an issue that we're being asked about. Uh, uh, almost every Hustings, I think, has been asked about that. And the media are also um, very interested in us talking about that question. So I had seen in the press that the Greens themselves had said, um, you know, that they may have issues with one or two of the candidates. So it may not be up to you know, individual candidates. The Greens themselves will have an idea about whether they want to stay in government. But my view on this is in order to be mature and responsible, they are our, currently our coalition partners in government and that this is a conversation for the, the new first minister to have with our partners to discuss whether we might be able to continue that relationship or not. And it might not be up to the first minister. The Greens, as I said, may have their own idea about that. Clearly, we're aligned with the Greens in many areas, obviously most particularly on independence, but there are some areas where we're not in alignment with the Greens, and it, it's perfectly legitimate. You know, we're two different political parties, so we're obviously going to have um, differences of opinion on that. But I'm, uh, I will say again, I'm very happy to stay in coalition with the Green Party, um, but we have to have that conversation with them first to see what, um, how that might take place. Um, I do think as well, though, that in terms of the wider movement, you know, the Green Party are very important in that. Um, I have already reached out to many of the members of the wider movement. I did actually call the Greens, but they were the ones that didn't call back. I'm sure I'll hear from them again over the next few days. I'll try them again soon. But they're very important in that wider movement. And I think we can all see that, you know, in terms of becoming successful at campaigning for independence, that it's very important that we unite that movement and that we can all work together um, to achieve that better Scotland that we all want to see. Thank you. Um, I still hope to get two questions in. Um, I'm going to take that lady there, and then there'll be a final question from over here. And the briefer the answers, the more time they will get to sum up. Hi, thank you. Um, I actually want to ask a wee question about independence. Um, given that referendum, the referendum auction has been blocked by a Tory Westminster government, how do you feel about calling an early Holyrood election and changing the rules so that a simple majority of MSPs would suffice? Okay, um, the next 
person on that is Hamza. So, uh, yeah, look, for me, I think every option should be on the table. I've said this uh, already, including an early Holyrood, Holyrood election. I think that has to be, every single election we fight has to be fought on advancing the cause of independence, whether it's the next general election uh, or any other uh, election. But we have to, as well as the process, and I absolutely understand and respect the reason why you're asking about the process, we have to convince the majority, not 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 when one poll says 54%, I think as it might do today, or 52%, and we had a poll yesterday that put us at 40-something percent. It's got to be a consistent majority for independence. So we got our Scottish Parliament. We got our Scottish Parliament because we had what was described as a settled will. When we had that consistent majority, when we inspire people, then the political obstacles that are put in front of us, they will disappear and dissipate. This idea that somehow, you know, we will get 50% plus one in an election, and that the UK government will march up the road to Edinburgh to begin negotiations with us is for the birds. I'm afraid this is a UK government that has no common decency. It's a UK government this week that stood up at PNQs and said they will actively breach international law and are proud of it when it comes to refugees. They are not going to abide by international law. And that's why we have to take popular support. And this is the answer to the second part of your question. I don't think, as tempting as it is, that's saying that a majority of seats, because we have to have popular support. I don't think any independence movement will be taken seriously if we don't demonstrate that we have more than 50% of the population behind us. I accept the temptation is absolutely there, but we will not win our independence unless we can demonstrate that popular support is behind us. Ash? Yes, thank you. I was waiting for the independence question and I can't believe we got so far into this meeting without it coming up. So, uh, yeah, I've actually been to the parliamentary clerks to look at exactly this question. So, uh, me and my team went into talks, and I think it was two weeks ago, and um, I, I think I have a press release going out on that today, if it hasn't already gone out, because I think that that gives us the same um, position, the same ability as any other parliament to be able to call an election at the time of our choosing, should we want to do that. I'm not suggesting that we use it right now, but I think it's very important to have that tool in our toolbox, if you like. Um, it could increase our leverage and it just gives us that opportunity should we want to use it. So I think that the strategy that we've been pursuing on independence for the last few years, you know, you can clearly see that it isn't working. So we're in a position where, and I don't have to tell the people in this room this, where we've been winning election after election after election. And we've been using that. Um, uh, and in the way I'm describing this, what we've been getting to is we've been using that to produce what I'm calling a moral mandate. And that moral mandate, we've been trying to use that to put pressure on Westminster to beg them to give us another referendum. And obviously, they haven't been accepting that. You know, they're deliberately setting out to thwart the will of the Scottish people. And their strategy with that is to prevent Scotland expressing its will. So I'm suggesting that we, um, we don't keep doing what we've already been doing because we already know what the result of that is going to be. You know, and to suggest that what we should do is just build up support, we already, we already have support. You know, there was a poll out um, yesterday putting support for independence at 52%. So I believe the support is there and if we run a good campaign, we will win that. So what I'm suggesting is that looking at the situation that we find ourselves in, that we need to look for another way to go about this. So I'm suggesting that we give that power back to the Scottish people, we allow them to choose. We have a permanent mechanism in place for the people of Scotland to use each and every election in order to express their support or their will or desire for Scotland to govern its own affairs. It won't be for um, a moral mandate, it will be a democratic choice expressed by the people of Scotland for Westminster and Edinburgh to begin those negotiations. Um, so there was another call out yesterday and it said that 69% of SNP voters agree that this strategy would be a democratic mandate to begin negotiations. And then if you strip out the don't knows, the majority of the public also agree with it. So I think this is gaining traction. I think many people would agree that a democratic mandate that's expressed by Scotland will be recognised not just by the UK government, but also by the international community. And we must also remember that international law is very pragmatic on this point. Um, I've studied, I studied international relations and development management, so I have some international law um, studies behind me when I say this. I also looked at the Smith Commission again yesterday, 
And the only thing written down on this topic is that there is nothing that can preclude Scotland from um, getting its independence. Um, some MPs have already spoken to some Conservative MPs um, quietly and privately about this, and some of them have said to them, of course they would respect a democratic mandate. We can't get into the opposition's framing here where we accept that they are, what are they going to do, be democracy deniers? They're not going to be. We live in a democratic culture where the authority of the ballot box is accepted. And we have to remember as well that not many countries have received their independence through referendums. It's much more normal to do that and to register that support through the ballot box. So the referendum is not the gold standard here. The ballot box is the gold standard. And I do not think that we need to ask permission from Westminster. And I also don't think it's acceptable that the UK government is seeking to hold Scotland hostage in this way. So if you pick me to be your leader, I have a plan, I have a strategy, and I believe we are only one election away from Scotland becoming an independent country. Thank you. And now, uh, Kate. Thanks very much. Well, I understand the principle of the question, and I think it's a fair question to ask, because it's really all about how we use the elections that we fight to further the cause for independence. I don't know about you, but whilst the polls are, they come and go, I'm disappointed that the dial hasn't shifted as substantially as I would have expected on independence, considering what we've been through, considering we've been through uh, Brexit and the impact on our economy, considering we've been through uh, or going through the cost of living crisis and, and Tory inflation, considering that we're seeing devolution constantly being chipped away at, I would have expected the polls to shift more substantially and they haven't. So we do need to take a moment to refresh and look at our next steps. Because if we get this wrong, then we're, we're, you know, independence will take longer. There are no shortcuts to independence. And I think that we should be using each and every democratic opportunity, including elections, to make the case for independence. For me, it boils down to a few critical elements, that, a few critical steps that we need to take. The first is, that we need to have a strategy to reach out to no voters. And again, I said it at the outset, it seems daft talking about people that don't vote for us right now when we're in an election contest. But I don't want Scotland to just become independent, slipping through, sliding through, and just making it. I want Scotland to be a successful independent nation, which is supported by as many Scots as possible. And I think we therefore need to listen, we need to reach out, and we need to persuade. And I happen to believe in the case for independence enough to think that they can be persuaded. I don't believe that we can't persuade more people to the cause of independence. So we need a leader that can reach out, can earn the trust. The second thing we need is to make independence real for people. Independence is real for us. We've been talking about poverty. We've been talking about cost of living. We've been talking about other public services. It's real for us. It's not just an abstract political term, but it's not real for everyone. And we need to make the link between why families are fuel poor in a country which is fuel rich. The answer to that is that the policies around energy have been made from people that are about as far removed from those affected as it's possible to be. You know, I come from a part of the world where, you know, there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of waves, there's a lot of tidal potential, and yet families can't afford their bills. It doesn't add up. So that illogic, irrational position is what we need to spell out to people. And we've talked a lot about poverty today, and I'm glad we've talked a lot about poverty, because for me, independence is a means to an end, and it's the end of poverty. But we need to spell that out. And, and my vision, and this is why I think we do need somebody that can take the economic fight on, we need to spell out within the first 10 years of independence, not 10 years to independence, first 10 years of independence, how Scotland truly will be wealthier and fairer. Because do you know what? If other small countries are fairer and wealthier than we are now and don't have the incredible resources that we do have in terms of our universities, our colleges, our talent, 
terms of our natural resources, if they can be fairer and wealthier without all the resources we have, then it kind of figures the problem might be, might be the old fashioned economic model that we're shackled to as part of Westminster. And so we need to sell that vision, not as an abstract political concept, but make it real for people. And I think that is how we persuade people and how we win our independence. The process is critical. I get that. The process is critical. But I actually think the process almost, not quite, takes care of itself when you build up that support. Not by working harder, but by having a belief in our vision, taking that vision to no voters and persuading them. Thank you. And now, final question. Final question. I'm going to take the final question from that gentleman there. Well, sorry, right. I, just, I, just, I just felt I had to. Otherwise, I'd just have wilted underneath it. But on you go. Uh, John Mackay, come on all branch and uh, believe in Scotland. I'm just going to follow up from what Kate was saying about, about the economics of independence there. Um, for 23 years, or is it 24 years, we have been battered over the head by Westminster with the Jairs figures. It's time to stop it. <laughs> successive, successive finance ministers in the SNP have been asked to produce figures for Scotland as if we were independent. I want to know why it's not happened and I want to know who's going to do it, please. Hey, good. Yes, sir, Ash, yes, sorry. This is, this is also the last question, so yes. candidates can sum up if they wish. Ash. Yes, I totally agree with you. So I had a conversation with Richard Murphy, um, who many of you will know, um, who is a, a commentator, a tax specialist, and does some work on political economy work as well about this very topic about three weeks ago now. And I committed to him um, because I completely agree with you. We are being these, these figures, and we know that the GERS was set up um, as a political tool to demonstrate that Scotland was too wee, too poor, and too rubbish to be successful. And that's what it's being used for. And we are being battered over the head with it every year. So I would stop, well, we can't stop the UK government using those set of figures, but what we can do is we can develop our own set of figures that better reflects the situation that Scotland would be in should it become independent, rather than what Jarrah's does is just reflect the situation, or partially reflect the situation that we're in right now. So I would agree with you, and I think that would be a good question for the cabinet secretaries as to know why this hasn't been done already. Okay. Um. Oh, sorry, and I just... Uh, so in terms of summing up, which I almost forgot to do, and I wouldn't want to miss out on the opportunity to talk about independence again. Um, so I ask you to pick me as your leader. I've worked um, for a long time before politics, so I've got lots of life experience that I can bring into this role. Um, I've worked in the private sector. I've worked in the third sector. Um, I want to set the independence movement free and inspire them to go off and do what they do best and get some of the best from the Yes campaign from last time around. Um, I think if you want a candidate, for devolution, you've got two excellent choices here. Um, but if you'd like a candidate who's prioritizing independence, then please vote for me. Thank you. Um, Hamza. Um, Andrew, was a, sorry, John, uh, it was a great question. Um, can I first of all commend the work of Believe in Scotland um, and Business for Scotland? I think they've done a phenomenal job. I was speaking to, to, to a few members uh, of Believe in Scotland and what, was really, what I really was struck by, so I will answer your question in a second, what I was really struck by was an excellent poll from about a week ago, I think it was, where if we centre our economic approach on the well-being economy, which I am wedded to, then support for independence increased, I think, to about 54% just from that one policy alone. So that's why I'm so supportive of the work of the, the well-being uh, economy. And it is groups like Believe in Scotland reach out to what, 130 yes movements and yes groups right across the country. Thank you, 136. The man who knows the numbers, right? 136 yes groups and movements. We've got to empower them. We've got to work with them to get our independence. Uh, short answer is yes, I would commit. I think I've written to business, uh, Believe in Scotland, actually with my full response uh, to say that I would absolutely commit uh, to those uh, independence JERS figures because you're right, what does JERS tell us? It tells us what the union dividend is. It tells us what the union dividend is. And what we've got to do is make sure that we're taking the true facts about the economy and the battling 
the economy has taken because we're part of the United Kingdom and get that into bite-sized chunks to you, the activists on the ground, who take it to doorstep, to doorstep, to doorstep. It's not just the job of the leader. Of course, we have an important job uh, to play, an important role uh, to play. Uh, but what I would say to you is it's the activists who are going to persuade people on the doorstep. So we've got to make sure you're armed with those figures, hence why the commitment uh, to those uh, figures of what an independent Scotland would and could achieve economically, because we know how wealthy we are. We know how rich we can be. We know that the UK is an outlier. Look at countries the size of Scotland, comparable countries in Europe, and they are not only wealthier, they are uh, they are uh, less uh, unequal. Uh, the UK is more unequal uh, than those countries. Um, so I can commit to that, and I think I've already done so in, in, in writing. I'll sum up by not giving you the whole pitch, because you've just heard us for the last um, two hours. I suppose I just wanted to say this much, that um, I'm a son of this party. <laughs> My dad joined in 1974. He tells me he was the first ethnic minority Asian member to join in Glasgow. I've never had that verified right enough, but he keeps telling me uh, that's the case. I'm afraid you're stuck with me, whatever happens. Uh, you're gonna find me with you, shoulder to shoulder, standing with you, act, uh, actively campaigning for independence. I would love to do that as leader of the SNP because I can believe, I believe that I share the values of the majority of the Scottish people. And if we share those values, then we're going to win more people to our, our, our uh, cause. Uh, I believe I can grow that movement, can reach across the divide, and importantly, inspire people. But let me say this much. We are stronger when we work as a team. We are stronger when we are united. We are stronger when we're not trashing our record, but trashing our opponents and taking them to task for everything that they do. So in that regard, I'm very proud uh, in, that, in that regard, I'm very proud to share a table with two phenomenal colleagues. Uh, three, sorry, Mike, you're a phenomenal colleague too. <laughs> but, 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 but two phenomenal colleagues in the Scottish Parliament who each have their own talents, who have all, we've all got to contribute to Scottish public life. Uh, and it's been a hard graph. We're almost at the end uh, of our party hustings. And I just want to say it's been a real pleasure sharing the stage with them. As someone who's had to face down the press pack on Jers several years in a row, I've got the scars. <laughs> and the one little teeny weeny little difference I think I might have with Hamza having agreed with everything else he said, is I don't think Jers shows you the union dividend. Jers, to my mind, is always shown as the cost of the union. Because if Jers is really so awful, then why is it that 70% of the revenue raised is actually reserved to Westminster and 40% of the revenue that's spent reserved to Westminster? Looks to me that if there's a problem with the JERS figures, the problem is how Scotland is being run right now as part of the union. And it is the biggest advert, as it were, for why the macroeconomics are failing Scotland time and time again. But you're absolutely right because we need to spell that out to people. It's not enough to just publish a load of figures. It's actually about spelling out how Scotland can not just afford to be independent, but how Scotland can afford not to be independent because we have the resources, because we've got the talent, and because we could be a lot fairer if we did it better. When it comes to a uh, publishing that. So one of the commitments I've made, it was one of the first commitments I made, was that if elected as leader, the first thing that I would do, certainly one of the first things I would do, is take that 10-year horizon for Scotland as an independent country for how we could, yes, pay our way, but more than that, that should not be the limit of our ambition, how we could actually deal with the deep inequalities that we have how we could take our resources, our small businesses, our large businesses, our workers, our talent, and ensure that Scotland is a fairer, wealthier country. And I think that does need to be a longer time horizon. Publish that as informed by members, because there's great talent and expertise amongst our members, and publish that um, so that that sits alongside whatever other figures are published. Uh, uh, every every year and of course we do publish the figures every year that Scotland balances its budget so every time you hear anything about a black hole your first question is you clearly don't understand economics and you don't understand uh, how the budgets work but taking a step back then the question for me at the heart of this hustings and actually whether or not there were hustings happening the question for all of us is this 
What does Scotland need right now? Who does Scotland need right now? What plan does Scotland need right now? We are agreed Scotland needs independence. But the question at this crossroads is how do we get there and who can take us there? And I think there's three things that we need from a leader to take us there. The first, as I said at the outset, is someone who can take on the opposition. We know, we don't like it, but we know with Keir Starmer here yesterday, he's spoiling for a fight and we need to beat him. We need to take on the opposition and we need to win by maintaining the trust of the Scottish people and delivering for them. So we need someone who can take on the opposition and continue to win elections. Secondly, we need somebody who can reach out to no voters and persuade them to vote yes. I, can, I know we can do it because I believe in the case for independence. We can do it, but it needs to be intentional. And there's a last thing that we need, and that is about team. Because within the SNP, we have people reflective of the diversity of the Scottish people. And our policies need to be built from the grassroots up. It's you who have the ideas, the experience, and the contacts to reach out to family members, to reach out to friends, and to make the case for independence. And I believe you can see that today already with the questions that we've had and with the talent of my colleagues here on the stage. We can get there. We're going to get independence. We're going to get there faster if we act as a team. And if the SNP is that truly democratic institution and organisation where policy and the vision for independence is built from the grassroots up. So the next leader that we need is someone who can persuade no voters to vote yes, someone who can take on the opposition and win elections, and somebody who can get in about it as a team, <coughs> ensuring that our members, our branch members, our activists are empowered to deliver independence, because independence is coming. Thanks. And that's us almost done. Thank you very much indeed for being here this afternoon. The voting papers go out on Monday. Uh, you will receive them either by email or if you don't use email, then you will receive them by post. And the ballot closes on the 27th, which is two weeks later. So uh, make sure that you vote early. Um, can I just make two further points? A, the first point is to say that uh, uh, the last, this is the second last hustings. The last hustings is in Aberdeen tomorrow. The candidates have another hustings today, starting at five o'clock for the SNP trade union group and, and the national newspaper. So they're hard pressed and then there will be at least two more um, television hustings next week. So they're working very hard at it, but thank you for you as an audience to be here. <laughs> these, um, these, these hustings, these hustings have been a credit to the SNP. Um, I think people know that watching them online. I think you should go out and tell people. That choosing a leader is a good thing for the SNP, and I look forward to what happens in the next fortnight too. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.